Welcome back, traders and investors. We have Todd Sullivan on the line. He is the founder of Rand Strategic Partners. Todd, how are you doing today? And tell us about your company. Um, I'm good, thank you. So, uh, the Rand is a long short hedge fund. I uh, co founded in December 2009. So, we've been Run a little over four years now, and uh, things are going well. We're happy and happy investors, so, you know, bull markets, everyone's smiling, right? Yeah, but well, you're long short hedge fund, so you got to be short some things. But uh, let's talk a little bit, uh, let's just start out macro here, and uh, what's your assessment of the, the macroeconomic situation? I, I, I've been optimistic um, on the macro situation, you know, for the last four years, and I remain optimistic on it. Um, I don't, I don't think we're growing gangbusters. I don't think we're about to grow gangbusters, but I don't see uh, any significant slowdowns uh, on the horizon. So I think, you know, the private economy is growing two to three percent right now. The, the the government and state economies and their pullbacks are, are the drag on it, which is why you're seeing. One to two percent GDP growth most quarters. Eventually, that drag's gonna gonna diminish, and eventually we're gonna start seeing two to three percent GDP growth more, more consistently. Uh, maybe higher next year. I don't, I don't. I'm not in the prediction business, but I, I don't, I don't see any major speed bumps on the horizon. You know, we we could get lucky and and get uh, some sort of activity out of. Uh, the government that uh, maybe spurs investment or spurs some economic activity, um, but uh, I'm not not overly optimistic on that either. So I think we just continue to kind of chug along where we have been the last couple of years. And um, given what we went through 08, 09, I think you know I think calm is is good rather than you know racing from from point to point. It's kind of the perfect scenario for the Fed. I mean, we're not we're not growing too fast, so you don't have to worry about interest rates going up, right, or uh, inflation. And we're just chugging along enough, uh, you know, where they can say QE's working. They really don't have any more tricks up their sleeve. So as long as we just kind of go with this kind of just slow growth here, it uh, it kind of fits the scenario. So I uh, have to agree with you on that. Um Housing sector, a lot of that, look at, um, you know, that is a key to the long-term direction of the market. I remember some of those stocks uh, turning up in 2011, 2012. Uh, what's your assessment of the housing housing market? And if you have any housing stocks in particular, let me know and we'll, we'll pull the charts up. I, I'm, I am, of all the sectors of the economy right now, I, I think housing has, still has a long way to run. I mean, we, we, after a couple of years of massive, massive overinvestment in housing, uh, for the, since 2008, we've massively underinvested in housing. And you know, household formations are still running a million, million to a year. And for a number of years, we're building six, seven hundred thousand homes a year. Um, even now, even the pace we're at now is still well below household formation. So there's still a, a huge gap um, from where we are to where we need to be in housing. And, and that's part of the reason you've seen housing prices increase what they have. It's, it's, it's a supply problem. I mean, right now we have a supply problem of available homes for people to buy. And that isn't going to be rectified anytime soon. Even if, even if builders wanted to, you know, open the spigots and go gangbusters, it would take a year or two for them to even begin to catch up to household formation. So I think the housing metrics we've seen have a way to go. I think when supply catches up, you might see um, price kind of level. And yet you're not going to see these, these, you know, five, six, ten percent price increases we've seen the last few years. You know, you might even see a flat line, but we're going to see transactions catch up. And in with where we are in the economy, you know, flat housing prices and transaction increases would actually be a really good thing. Because uh, that would mean more jobs, more construction jobs, more you know, and, and everything that goes along with with increased housing sales. It's just hugely beneficial for the economy. So, um, my, as far as stocks go, my favorite um, real estate related stock um, it has been uh, since 2010 and still remains the Howard Hughes Corporation (HHC). Um, they were uh, a spinoff of uh, the General Growth Property Bankruptcy. In, uh, in that spinoff, they received uh, master plan communities 
in Las Vegas, Houston, uh, Columbia, Maryland. They got uh, 60 plus acres on the waterfront in Honolulu, South Street Seaport. And they got a collection of really unbeatable assets. And they're sitting on these assets with a cost basis of basically zero huh. uh, because the way the, the structures work. So what, what Howard Hughes is doing is right now they were an asset rich land company. They're selling this land to builders, or in some cases, building themselves homes on this land. As these master plan communities are populated, they're using that land to build income-producing properties, shopping malls, uh, office buildings, rental units. So they're transforming themselves from a company that has that's incredibly um, land-rich to an income-producing company, and they're not doing it with debt. Right, so what they're doing is, is they have, you know, they have, you know, 4,000 homes built in the area. They need office parks and strip malls and whatever to, to put to, to serve the people who live there. They partner with a, a builder. Their contribution to that joint venture is the land. We're going to give you, you know, this land value to this. You contribute the cash. You build it. We'll take the finish on the joint venture. And they're doing this all over the place. So they're transforming themselves to a company that simply, simply sits on land into a REIT and they're in a highly unlevered REIT. So when they get to that tipping point, um, there's, there's going to be huge potential for whether they spin off the REIT division, keep the land division, or buy back a huge amount of shares, whatever they want to do. Um, I've said for, I don't know, two years now, I think it's, a, it's with the company, as it sits now, with the assets that are currently in development, it's a $10 billion company. Um, which I think right now their their market value is roughly five or six. Hmm. So I think the stock stock price can double from where it is. Not not necessarily double. The stock price is one hundred forty now. So I think it's worth about two fifty a share. I said it since it was in the seventies and um You stick it to it. And yeah, I, I, if anything, it's it's gonna be worth more than that. Um with what they have before. if you look at what they're doing the South Street Seaport. Um, you know, they just built, they're building luxury condo towers on the waterfront in Honolulu. There's, they had a line around the block to buy and the thing sold out in, in 20 hours. Um, they, they, they own Summerlin in Vegas, which is the number one master plan community in the United States. And they're building a whole downtown section there that's completely leased out. The thing's not even ready yet. It'll be ready in, in the fall. Um, they have, the, the asset collection they have, where they have it, it's just amazing. They own the Woodland, another mass crown community in Houston. Exxon Mobil is moving their headquarters there. 10,000 people are going to move in that area. They're going to need hotels, office buildings, you know, dry cleaners. They're going to need a massive amount of infrastructure built out. And Howard Hughes is doing that. And it's, 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 it's incredibly unfollowed. I think there's one analyst that follows it right now. And they were spun off in 2010 at $35 a share. They're at 140 now. And I think before this is said and done in the next year or two, or things at 250. You know, I, I like I'm getting my buy order right now. You've uh, really convinced me, <laughs> and uh, and uh, you're the second person uh, in the last week uh, that has mentioned that equity is something they really like. And uh, I guess you're in pretty good company because uh, Whitney Tilson, uh, this was one of his favorite stocks as well. Um, also, just kind of talking about the whole bland theory. I mean, I just this is a total spinoff from this, but uh, you get that. You know, a company like Cabela's. Are you familiar with that? Uh, they they put up their their stores in small remote areas. They buy everything around it, and then they just parcel it off because their store is such a big attraction. They sell it to restaurants. They sell it to builders. They sell it to strip malls and stuff. So that uh, that definitely works. Uh, what about some other? What are some of your other favorite stocks? You really got me convinced on Howard Hughes. I gotta gotta figure out what to put the other half of my portfolio into. Um, the other, the other stock, probably the, it's, you know, Howard Hughes obviously is a, is a land stock. So, you know, you, you might get a little volatility around it for some people who are scared of stuff like that. Um, mm-hmm. With, uh, you know, the month the numbers come out and it kind of tricks around sometimes. But I think over the next, you know, couple of years, you're going to be fine with that. Um, if you're looking for a safety, AIG, I think with where they are and their turnaround, uh, we first bought AIG in 2012, in the beginning of 2012 at around 26. And I still hold, still hold it. Uh, haven't sold a share, and over the last year or so, I've increased it. Um, they are on 
they're on the precipice right now of turning around the insurance operations fully and starting to produce some serious, um, seriously positive insurance results. Combined ratios are falling. Accident ratios continue to fall. The cash position is, cash position is incredibly strong. I just announced a $2 billion buyback. Um, I think that's probably, probably, um, going to be increased before the year's out as they continue to buy back these shares. Um, they have liquidity to do more. I think they're being overly cautious right now. They just sold um, ILFC. Uh, the original offer they got for that from a company was what well, Chinese consortium was five billion. Uh, they ended up selling it to AER, uh, which is a, another airline leasing company. And the, in that deal, they took a, a slug of stock, 97 million shares of AER. Uh, AER is now the dominant aircraft leasing company in the world. Uh, their stock has gone from 24 to 47, which means AIG got an extra $2 billion out of the deal. They ended up selling it for roughly, you know, just under $8 billion. Uh, they can start selling that stock at the end of this year. They got to sell it in uh, nine months, 12 months, 15 months is the, the time frame time they can frame, sell so. it all. I think as, I think as they sell that stock, they announce more buybacks. So, um, Ben Mulcahy's history, you know, he, 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 he likes to, you know, be a consistent gobbler up of his stock. And they bought a hell of a lot back the last year or two, and I think they're going to continue to do that. The book value is going to be 70 bucks by the end of the year. Um, the liquidation value for it, uh, right now they're trading at you know 54. So you still got you know 16, 17 bucks a share there, just to get to the liquidation value. Well, other insurers are selling a one to 1.2 times book, so you could even go you know up to 80 bucks for this thing. Um, before you even have to start having the conversation of, you know, is this fairly valued or overvalued, uh, it's still massively undervalued. And it's, you know, it's a it's an extremely well-capitalized insurance company right now. And the things that they did to get them in trouble, um, this was before current management, you know, was there. Uh, they're no longer there at the company. They no longer invest in those things. They no longer, you know, are, are insuring every CDO out there. Um, they don't insure any anymore, actually. Um, and then moving into the mortgage insurance business um, in the correct way, the way Fannie and Freddie used to do it, uh, when they, you know, were, you know, high-performing utility-like companies that, you know, generated consistent cash flows. They would United guarantee the mortgage insurance business, was, which is the, the number one private mortgage insurer out there. You know, and they're insuring, they're insuring 750 FICO, 90% loan-to-value loans with a 5% default uh, on, the ba- on a bad day. So, I mean, they're just doing fantastic, so... Okay. Any uh, any sectors to avoid? Um, I personally, I'm not a huge fan of you know what's been happening. A lot of momentum stocks right now. I think there's a lot of real excessive valuations there, and um, you know there's a lot of people talking about the market's going to either stagnate or do for a drop. And I think those are the areas that um, should that happen, we'll we'll get the legs taken off under them first, and I think it'll be hard. And you have a lot of you have a lot of stocks out there um, with really aggressive counting whose management is selling shares as fast as they can and who are doing some stupid things with their money, uh, like Green Mountain Coffee Roasters, um, that if you get any kind of market correction, I, I think they're going to just utterly collapse. I mean, Green Mountain Coffee sold $2 billion worth of stock to Coke at $76 a share, and then off a $2 billion buyback at one hundred and fifteen. dollars And that's just... That's... That, I mean, it, 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 that is the... You know, quintessential stupid cash allocation for a company to do. And, and they, they recently just did it again. Um, it's, you know, it's the closest thing you can get to, you know, trying to pop up a stock. And, and you know, management announces the latest deal, um, and they pop the stock up in the middle of dumping, they're dumping shares as fast as they can the next day. So even they don't even want to be part of this, this joke anymore. So it's only a matter of time before stocks like that, you know, get their reckoning and, and, and come down. You know, salesforce.com. You know, if you look at the insider sales at Salesforce.com in the last two, four years, I think they've sold almost half a billion dollars worth of stock. Um, and the company is only growing because they're out there issuing more stock to, to buy companies. So eventually you get to a certain size. That doesn't work anymore. Um, people actually want to know we have for earnings. So Salesforce.com is a, is a money-losing operation. It's, a, it's losing money every year, losing more money every year, and it's a, in, its a, in its entire existence. It's a losing money oper- It's a money losing operation. I mean, you can increase revenues all day long selling a dollar for fifty cents, right? And you're gonna you're gonna have more and more sales each year because everyone wants to get a part of that. Um, eventually, you become a large enough company 
you can't keep doing that anymore at 35% a year. Nope. Growth, revenue growth. And people want to see profits, and there are none. There are none at Salesforce. Um, so eventually that, you know, price and value always meet. You know, they may disjoint yep. for years, but eventually they always meet. And people are going to look at Salesforce one day and say, there's, there's, there's no earnings here. This isn't, this isn't worth nearly what it's worth now. And when they recognize that, and I think they kind of starting off the last couple of earnings calls, the stock's kind of taken a hit and it's been sort of struggling lately. And I think people are, you know, despite Wall Street's efforts to pump it up, you know, every time they, they come out and they announce less impressive earnings and increasing gap losses, Wall Street raises their price targets. Uh, <laughs> the only reason they're growing, now, yeah, the only reason they're growing now is because of the last grossly overpriced acquisition they made, in which they, you know, obviously use a lot of stock. They've diluted stockholders, I think, 20% over the last three or four years. Right. And there's more dilution coming, so. Yeah, not good. Okay, we've had Todd Sullivan on, founder of Rand Strategic Partners, talking a little macro, the housing sector, giving some of his favorite picks and some of his least favorite picks. Todd, thanks for coming on today. We really enjoyed uh, having you, and uh, we'll speak to you again soon. Thanks. Have a great day. Okay. Thank you, Todd.